So I believed I've just taken my best ever picture of the Triangulum Galaxy Messier 33 from my rooftop balcony here in Tokyo, Japan, one of the most light polluted cities on the planet. And this is partly thanks to this filter, the SV240 by SV Boni. And this is a filter that quite a few of you have asked me to uh, review. And so here I am reviewing it. So what is this filter? Uh, it's actually a very interesting filter and it is basically a cheaper clone of the IDAS GNB filter, which I've reviewed on the channel before. But basically the principle is that you have two band passes that are fairly wide uh, around the oxygen three and hydrogen alpha wavelength, which correspond to the main emission wavelength of emission nebulae, like the California nebula, the North America nebula, the Eagle nebula, the Orion nebula, etc. So it's a dual band filter in that way. But in addition to that, it's also having a band pass in the near infrared spectrum, roughly between 750 nanometers to 900 nanometers, which is not a visible wavelength, but which is very resistant to things like light pollution and atmospheric seeing. It's also resistant to like space dust. So uh, that can be both a positive and a negative. And so let's look a bit more into this. Before we go any further, this filter is priced as roughly uh, 170 US dollars by default. Sometimes it's on sale at 120, 30 US dollars. And also please check the links that I have down in the description if you're interested, because it's likely SV Boni will give me a coupon code that you can use to get a small discount on the filter. It's also important to note that SV Boni sent me this filter. I do believe I get to keep it, I'm not sure, but just keep that in mind as this could color my review of the filter. So here we are on the web page for that filter. And what is particularly important to look at is uh, this uh, image here, which is the wavelength uh, diagram for that filter, what wavelength it uh, lets us through. And you can see we have exactly at around 500 nanometers, there is one wavelength for oxygen three. We have another one at around, at around 656 for hydrogen alpha. And then we have the one that starts at around 750 and uh, almost at like 920. And that is for the near infrared. All of this bandpass here is invisible to us, but it is in the infrared spectrum. I've also measured the rest of the uh, bandpass with my spectrophotometer to double check if the specs are exactly as shown on this diagram. So we'll look at that in a moment. Now, this near infrared, uh, it's useful only for some cameras. Meaning that if you use something like the uh, ZW585MC um, 585 Pro or the Topetech variant, the ATR585, I believe is the name, and I have the links to all of that down in the description, those cameras and those sensors, while being very cheap, it's basically the cheapest cooled astrophotography camera type that you can buy, they also allow a lot of near infrared in as long as you don't filter it out. If however, you're using something like a 585 based camera, uh, it receives far less infrared and the dual versions from ZW like uh, this one here, actually the window on top of the sensor filters out infrared. So you cannot use this camera to capture the infrared spectrum from uh, this particular filter. But if you were to use the filter with this camera, it basically would act as a standard dual band filter. So if you don't have a dual band filter and you need one and you want to have like that extra infrared capability, should you wish to use it later on, that's also a definite possibility. And by the way, how do you know if your camera window has an infrared slash uh, UV uh, cut filter on top? If you angle it, you'll see that it becomes like a magenta type of color. This is a dead giveaway that you have uh, such a filter on the sensor window. Some Tope Tech cameras, by the way, uh, you can choose, actually most of them, you can choose between a normal transparent window and an IR cut uh, window. And I personally prefer to select the normal one because I can add my own IR cut filter uh, later on. If I do the same thing with the 585 camera, you can see it, it never really turns that magenta color. Nothing really happens as, as, as I angle that, uh, that window. It has a clear transparent window, basically. Okay, let's have a quick look at the specs, by the way, of the uh, 585 sensor. Those curves 
happen to be from the ZW website, but they're true for pretty much any camera that uses that 585 sensor. So uh, we have the curves, uh, you can see we have the usual, you know, blue, green, and red response curves. Uh, those are the uh, kind of like the quantum uh, efficiency absolute values. And as you can see, we have like the standard 80 to 90%, a bit above 90% for each of the RGB filters that are on top of uh, the camera pixels. But also what's very interesting is that you look starting from around 800 nanometers all the way down to 950 and beyond, we have around uh, between let's say 40 and 50% transmission across all of those uh, color filters, which means that effectively in those uh, color in infrared, this camera sensor is basically transparent and it acts as a monochrome sensor. And when you remember that something like the ASI 071 MC Pro had roughly 50% quantum efficiency throughout the range, it basically acts as a monochrome 071 sensor in that range, which is very interesting. And also it's gonna be a bit of an issue for color management because now you have colors coming from this 500 nanometer here, colors coming from 756 here, but then all of the other color is actually black and white. It will be registered as black and white, more or less, by the, uh, by the sensor and the algorithm we use to get the colors out of it afterwards. If in contrast, we look at something like the ASI 2600 MC Pro uh, that is without uh, an IR cut filter on top of it, unlike the Duo uh, versions, you can see that uh, we have, again, a si similar phenomenon uh, around 800 nanometers to uh, 900. But now we are closer to 35 to uh, like between 20 and 35 percent quantum efficiency. That's actually relative response. We don't have the absolute response. Uh, but it, it assumes that it's above 80% in terms of the top here. So actually that would put us maybe at around 20% uh, sensitivity, quantum efficiency around that range. So you can see that even without an IR cut window, the IMX571 sensor based cameras cannot take full advantage of uh, that particular filter, but it can still be used as a simple dual band H alpha oxygen three uh, filter. Quickly, I want to show you the results of my spectrographic analysis of the filter. My spectrophotometer cannot measure the wavelength in the near infrared, so that's why you don't see it. Here we have the results of the filter as measured by my spectrometer. And we have basically band passes of roughly 22 to 25 nanometer for width half max for both of those uh, band passes. The H alpha is centered pretty much here. So very well centered on H alpha. Oxygen three is around here. So it is not perfectly centered, but that doesn't really matter because the wavelengths, I mean, the band pass is so wide, so we don't really care. And interestingly, if you go back to this diagram here, it's actually exactly the same thing. It is absolutely like a carbon copy of the specs as they have in the diagram. So uh, I confirm the filter seems to be working as per specifications, which is really nice, all the way to the actual transmission. For me, I measured a transmission of around 94 to 95%, and the, uh, the diagram here has 95%. So at least for the visible spectrum portion of uh, the, the band pass, the filter is exactly as per specifications, which is a very good thing. Now let's go into how that filter has performed on the Triangulum Galaxy M33. And by the way, if you're curious about how it would perform on Nebula, etc., you can actually watch uh, Luco Matico's video on the IDAS GNB filter because it's a carbon copy. It has the same band passes, it's just more expensive than the SV Boni version. And so I'll put a link up above, but also down in the description to his video, as well as, you know, I, I want to self promote myself, a link up above and down below to my own review of the uh, IDAS GNB filter. If you're scrolling down below, by the way, and you like this kind of review and you want to support me, please leave a like on the video, watch the video till the end because that's all that YouTube cares about. And you can also leave a comment, let us know what you think of this filter or what cameras you'd want to be using it with. And if you're new to the channel, you can consider subscribing. It really helps the channel out. If you want to support me even more and you're planning on buying anything from Agena, High Point Scientific, First Light Optics, Amazon, etc. If you do so after clicking any of the links that I have in the description, it will help me out at no cost to you. And of course, there are links to the filter with a coupon and to those cameras just in case. If you want to sponsor the channel directly, you 
can join my Patreon as a member. The link is down in the description as well. Or you can join the channel as a member using the join button next to the subscribe button. It really helps the channel. It, it makes all of those videos possible. I cannot thank you enough for your generosity. Okay, so here is the result on M33 using my Carbon Star 150 telescope uh, together with the filter and my IMX uh, 585 camera. I actually used the Taupe Tech version of that, uh, of that sensor. Uh, and uh, yeah, it looks very nice. I was really happy to see that with all of the details that we see. We see individual stars in the galaxy. It's, it's insane. I absolutely love this and this is probably the sharpest image that I've ever gotten of this galaxy. At the same time, if I zoom into a bright star, we might see a little bit of a halo, like we can see those like um, halo-ish reflections that come in, but there's nothing serious on that front. I mean, maybe if you're pointing to Alnitak, you might have some issues, but then the anti-reflection coatings that are on our camera windows and in our optics in general, they're typically not made for infrared. So it's kind of to be expected. And I would expect those halos to be less visible if you use them with a, a sensor that has this IR cut window on it, or you stack them with a UV IR cut filter, I'm not sure, something to, uh, to keep in mind, but definitely well controlled here. Uh, but when we look at this image, something we can see is that there is a weird color cast. Everything looks to be like a bit green. Uh, the nebulae, are properly, so we, we see those nebulae from a galaxy far, far away, which is completely insane to me, but those nebulae, they have the proper color, but the body of the galaxy, it looks like it's monochrome with somewhat of a green tint. Uh, and that's kind of expected because we have twice as many green pixels as we have blue or red pixels in the camera. And so if I were to use this uh, galaxy image on its own, it's probably not going to give me the best result in terms of colors. In terms of details, I'll get some amazing results. But in terms of colors, I feel like I'll be missing something. And this is actually exactly the same conclusion that I had reached with my IDAS GNB filter review. And, uh, but still, like this is straight out of camera. It looks awesome. If I do a quick bit of processing, like typically like five, 10 minutes processing with blur exterminator, noise exterminator, spectrophotometric color calibration, removal of gradients, and then stretching, this is what I get. And this is also pretty cool. We have a beautiful image there, but it's true that it lacks colors. In a way, it draws attention to the stars, it draws attention to, to those nebulae, but it lacks overall color and overall punch. But I'm very happy with this image in and of itself. However, I think what this filter is best at is when you combine it with data taken with a color camera. It could be the exact same camera that you used with the filter, like this 585, but taken with just a UV slash IR cut filter, because then you have the natural colors and you can use this image as luminance, as basically the details layer for your color image. So let's do exactly that, because I have this uh, stretched image and you can see on the left-hand side, I also have an image that I took three or two years ago, I don't remember, with my Hyperstar telescope. Uh, and that image with the Hyperstar telescope on the left is, I believe, seven hours of data. The image on the right with the SV240 from SV Boni is around six hours of data. So we have a total of 12 hours between those two uh, images. And as expected, you can see the color image has tons of gradients all over the place. That's normal. We are imaging from Tokyo. I mean, there's, there's so much, only so much we can do. But if we look at uh, the um, SV240 uh, image, we, we don't see that at all. The filter has properly, you know, basically removed the light pollution at the detriment of color. So now we can put both together. By the way, the image on the left here from the Hyperstar has been color calibrated. It ha has also had uh, blur exterminator, noise exterminator applied. And now we just need to align the stars from this image with a, a different field of view to the image on the right. By the way, to align those two images in PixInsight with different field of views and different pixel scales, uh, you can fairly easily do it by making sure that they have the same orientation. Uh, Hyperstar image, are typically mirrored. So make sure you have roughly the same uh, rotation and also the same mirroring uh, on both images. And then you can draw a preview that approximates the field of view of the second image here. And then you can use uh, the star alignment process here 
and you can select your reference image as the um, SV240 image here. And then you want to align based on the preview that you have drawn. So I'm gonna add view, select my preview here, validate, and then I can just uh, go ahead and try to see if that works. And you can see immediately it works. So now we have the hyperstar image on the left that is completely aligned to the SV Boni SV240 uh, image on the right. After star alignment and stretching of the uh, image from my hyperstar telescope, here we have on the left the aligned results from hyperstar. We don't have any color saturation yet, but you can see we see all of those like kind of like dark nebulae that are much less visible on our SV Boni SV240 image. And this is simply because infrared pierces through those dark lanes. So in a way we've lost some, some detail or some information about those, about those dark lanes because we see through them literally with the SV240 filter. But now what becomes very interesting is joining those two images together. For that, I would simply take the luminance channel of the SV Boni image. So I'm gonna use really the uh, luminance information from, uh, from that image. And then I can use the LRGB combination process here. You want to make sure that both images are stretched already, which they are in this case. And then you can unselect the uh, R, G, and B channels, select our luminance image as the monochrome SV240 image, and then apply it to the uh, color image that you have prepared with a UVIR cut filter. And this is what we get with the uh, before and then the after. And isn't that amazing? We keep the dust lanes at the center of the galaxy, but we recover so much detail. And if we wanted to, we could go further and do continuum extraction and li like have more stress onto the nebulae themselves. But this is such an incredible change and we get back the colors now. If I were to go to my curves transformation here and go to uh, saturation, I can saturate quite a bit and you can see we are getting those color backs. It really looks super nice like that. And after a little bit more processing, this is the result that I get as a merged image of the SV240 and the luminance data. And I would never in a million years be able to achieve that from Tokyo without using that SV240 filter there. I also have a second version with a bit more contrast where the galaxy is more separated from the background. But let me know what you think of those images down in the comments. I personally find this is absolutely amazing, but seriously, just like for the IDAS GNB, on its own, the filter is probably not that great unless you're using it on simple nebula and you have an, a UVIR cut filter as well. For example, for example the, the window of this camera. And then it becomes a simple dual band filter. Otherwise, it's a beast if you're going to combine its information data with lumens data. And this was the simplest combination that I could do. We could also extract the color data from our SV240 filter result and then try to reintegrate it back in the color image. We could take the continuum extraction of H alpha and oxygen three from the SV240 filter and put that back into the main image. There's a lot of stuff that we can do, but it does require quite a bit more processing. So you have to be aware of this obvious limitation of the filter. It's a decent dual band filter for nebulae, that's for sure. It has like those fairly wide band passes. It's not too expensive, etc., etc. But if you're to ju use just that filter on galaxies, I think you'd be a bit disappointed. You'd see an awesome image in terms of details, but not in terms of colors. And that's exactly what I had seen with the IDAS GNB as well. However, if you have both the color information on one side and then the SV240 information on the other side, now we're talking, as you saw with M33 example here. So what are your thoughts on this filter? Let me know down in the comments below. Also, while you're at it, you can like the video. It really helps the channel out. And if you're planning on buying anything from Agena, High Point, First Light Optics, or even Amazon, if you do so after clicking the links that I have in the description, it will help me out at no cost to you. If you want to sponsor the channel, and help make those videos possible, you can join my Patreon. The link is down in the description. Or we can join the channel as a member using the join button next to the subscribe button. With that, thank you so much for watching. Don't forget whenever you can to look up at the stars and I'll see you next time.